If you have your Bibles, turn with me to the book of 1 Peter chapter number 1. Peace is really kind of the theme of this portion of Peter, or 1 Peter, dealing with the peace that God gives his children who are going through great trials. And this morning, we're going to look at the thought of a glorious salvation and how there's peace in our salvation that we have in Christ. I'm not one big on dreams, and, um, but, and I, matter of fact, I seldom have actual dreams. I just, or they say you have them every night, but you don't remember them. I definitely don't remember mine. It's rare that I ever have any kind of dream whatsoever. However, this week I awoke to a dream, a couple of series of dreams that I had, and I want to share just a glimpse of what they were, and uh, from that then we'll get into the scripture. As I woke up, I thinking about what I had dreamed, it was a widow who was preparing to die. She had lived for many years with her loved one, struggling each day, and she had somehow made it to the end. But what now? What awaits on the other side of death's door were her thoughts. Had her faith been in vain? Is her life beyond the grave? And or will this be her end? Her children, her grandchildren, her dear friends were all gathered around her bedside. And as she closed her eyes in faith, she said a small prayer and then drifted out into eternity. My following dream was this. It was a similar story. A young boy, though, this time was innocent as could be with a heart of gold. He did not choose the life that he was born into. However, it was the only life that he had known. Someone had told this young boy that Jesus loved him. And those were words that he had never heard before. He didn't understand love, but he knew that it was something special when he heard the words. His parents would fight and yell. They would abuse him. He didn't think they were bad people, but he never knew what might happen when they would take their special medicine. One night, his parents, in an extremely out of sorts from the drugs, when they had gripped their minds, in a fit of rage, they began to act as this boy had never seen them before. The little boy closed his eyes and prayed to God. He prayed for peace. He prayed for the screaming to cease, for God to hold his hand. As a young boy there was hiding in the house, he closed his eyes in prayer when his parents... In a fit of psychotic rage, the hammer struck, the gun fired, and the boy entered into eternity. That's how I awoke from my dream that night. You say, preacher, was that real? No, it wasn't. But for many in the shadow of this steeple, that's a real scenario. The truth is, people all around us are dying, and have you ever questioned, is salvation real? What's the point of us coming to church and we sing the songs of peace, but is it real? Is it authentic? Sometimes, and I've never really experienced that, but I woke up almost struggling to differentiate from truth and dreams, reality, and it was, it was a struggle, but the truth is that for many people, their nightmares are true. We labor, we hope, we go through life, we pray, we read our Bibles, we come to church, we go through the activities of religious endeavors, but is it real? When we close our lives in death, we face and we drift off to eternity, is our salvation real? Is there hope beyond this life? If there's not, what are we doing? Here in 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse number 10, Paul is drift, speaking to people who are going through great persecution. At the end of verse 9, he said, You would receive the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We looked at that last week. And this week in verse number 10, he picks up. He says, Of this salvation... 
the prophets have inquired and searched carefully who prophesied of the grace that would come to you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicating when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves but to us they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. Things which angels desire to look into. This morning, I want to preach on this thought, as I said earlier, on a glorious salvation. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we do come to you in prayer. God, I pray that, Lord, you would help the Christian who's here today, Lord, who has a lost sight and focus of what matters what's important God may once again you grip our hearts revive us Lord to have a passion for the gospel Lord for the one who's here today who does not know you as their personal Savior God I ask that they would not leave today until they know Lord, that their life and their faith has been placed solely in your hands. Father, we love you and we thank you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. We find here in Scripture this glorious salvation that's being spoke of, that the prophets predicted it. They prophesied of things that really they didn't fully understand. The Bible says that they searched carefully here, and they inquired, they wanted to understand this salvation. They, they saw glimpses of it in the Old Testament, but they could not really comprehend the fullness of the gospel, the story of Jesus Christ. They spoke it because they believed, uh, even though it was a concept beyond their field of knowledge or expertise, yet that they prophesied of what was going to come. In Matthew chapter 13, verse number 17, the Bible says, For assuredly I say to, to you that many prophets and righteous men desired to see what you see, and did not see it, and to hear what you hear, and did not hear it. They, what they sought to understand was the grace of God. If you understand that in the Old Testament they were... Uh, under the law and here they were being prophesied of this grace that would come through Jesus Christ and they did not understand it. they sought to see it but they couldn't see it they sought to hear it uh, but they did not hear it the prophets of the Old Testament they prophesied of what would come we'll look at those verses here in just a moment but they believed that God would send a savior a suffering savior the Bible says here that he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ in verse number 11. Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. In the very beginning the Bible says, And I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your seed and her seed. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. From Genesis chapter 3 there was a prophecy of the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ that... Um, that there would be enmity between the seed and that the head would be bruised and the heel would be bruised. And so Satan would bruise the heel of Christ, but Christ would ultimately bruise the head of Satan. He would strike a lethal blow. And we know that one day that will be fulfilled completely when Satan is cast into outer darkness. But there was a prophecy that Jesus Christ would suffer. The sufferings of the cross of Christ on Calvary, they were predicted long before. In Isaiah chapter 50 and verse number 6, the Bible says, I gave my back to those who struck me and my cheeks to those who plucked out my beard. I did not hide my face from shame and spitting. So we knew even from Isaiah that there would be the strikes of Jesus across his back and his face and his brow. In Zechariah chapter 12, verse number 10, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his holy son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. 
The Bible even here predicts in Zechariah that Jesus Christ would be pierced. There was the prophets, they prophesied and predicted, they sought out the suffering of the Savior. They wanted to understand what does this mean that our Savior will be persecuted, that the Messiah would suffer. They did not understand that because they were looking for a Messiah who would be a king, a ruler, a military power and might. They were not looking for a lamb who would be brought to the slaughter, yet they predicted, they prophesied that Jesus Christ would, the Savior, would suffer. Not only did they prophesy of the suffering Savior that was to come, but they also prophesied of the glory that would come. The Bible says at the end of verse number 11, when he testified beforehand the suffering of Christ and the glories that would follow. They prophesied of the glories that would come through the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. They, first off, it was the glory of God himself. Isaiah chapter 9, verse number 6 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. They knew that the Messiah would come and he would be the everlasting father and the prince of peace. They did not understand all the ins and outs of the New Testament doctrine and doctrines of grace and how the law would be done away with. But they knew that God's glory would be manifest. In Daniel chapter 7 verse number 13 and 14 says, I was watching in the night vision and behold one like the son of man coming with clouds uh, with the clouds of heaven, he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom, that all peoples and nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. They prophesied of the glory that would come. That God would be manifest in all of his glory. Not only prophesy of his glory, but also of the glory of his people. That is, those who place their faith and trust in Christ. Those who are his chosen. Isaiah chapter 51, verse number 11. The Bible says, So the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy on their heads. They shall obtain joy and gladness. Sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Then also to the church. I believe in Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 23 it says, Then I will sow her for myself in the earth, and I will have mercy on her who had not obtained mercy. Then I will say to those who are not my people, You are my people. And they shall say, You are my God. This salvation that is manifest through Jesus Christ. The glory of our salvation was prophesied in the Old Testament. The Bible says they sought out to understand this grace. And do you understand this morning that the very grace of God that gives salvation that is offered to you is something that throughout the Old Testament, throughout the Bible, they sought to understand, they sought to see and experience, and they could not. Yes, they had a temporal uh, aspect of it, a picture of it that was in the, the temple and, the, and the, the sacrifices that were given. But that's nothing compared to what we have in Jesus Christ. The temple in Jerusalem, the sacrifices that are offered. I, we mentioned again last week we're going in January. And if you've never been, I encourage you to let me know. You ought to go to Jerusalem and experience Israel. It'll change your life. And they are trying to rebuild the temple. And there's much talk about it, prophetic talk about it. And it's interesting to study and see. But the truth of the matter is that the temple in all its grandeur and glory was nothing compared to the glory that was brought in Jesus Christ, the Lamb that took away our sins forever. We read in the, story, the Bible of great prophets and men of God. And yet none of them have experienced what I've experienced. We find here not only was the prophets 
prophesied of it. But second of all, this glorious salvation, this salvation that saved from sin, this salvation that brought forgiveness in our lives and peace from problems and joy from suffering, it was broadcast from the believers. The believers broadcast this great, glorious salvation. And Peter here is trying to encourage the church who's going through suffering and saying, listen, I know you're suffering. I know you're going through heartache and trials. But I want you to know that even in your trials, even in your suffering, you are experiencing something, the grace of God, that the prophets that you read after, they would have given everything to experience what you've known. But then he said, listen, the believers have broadcast it. Verse number 12 says, To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which have now been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. The believers have broadcast it. Matthew chapter 28, verse number 1 through 8. Here we find, the Bible says, Now after the Sabbath, as the first day of the week began to dawn, Mary and Magdalene and the other Mary came to see the tomb. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat on it. His countenance was like lightning, and his clothes as white as snow. The guard shook for fear of him and became like dead men. But the angel answered and said to the woman, Do not be afraid, for I know that you seek Jesus who was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. As he said, come, see the place where the Lord lay. And go quickly and tell his disciples that he is risen from the dead. And indeed, he is going before you into Galilee. There you will see him. Behold, I have told you. So they went out quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples word. Here we find that they come to the tomb and they find that the tomb has been found empty. He was not there. I can assure you I've been to the tomb there, the garden tomb, and it is empty. It's just a barren tomb. There's nothing there. Jesus Christ has rose from the dead, but the Bible says they were commanded to go and tell the disciples that he has risen from the dead. And the Bible says they ran quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples' word. Here in 1 Peter, the Bible says that they were being reported the salvation has been prophesied to, but also it's been preached by those who had the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. The believers broadcast. They broadcast the things of God. They broadcast that Jesus Christ was who he claimed to be. They broadcast in active service. They broadcast because they were willing to be obedient to the angel who said, go tell the disciples that he is not here. He is risen from the dead. One of the glories of our salvation is that we've experienced something. You and I have been offered an experience, an opportunity, a joy of the, to understand and experience the grace and forgiveness of Jesus Christ. But also, we have an opportunity to partake in it that you and I can go and share with the world the good news that Jesus saves. We can actively be a part in telling others what Christ has done. And here we find that they were active in the service. I wonder, here Mary and Magdalene and Mary, they ran and told others of the good news that Jesus was not dead, that he was risen from the grave. What I wonder this morning is what message are we telling the world? What message are we giving? Is our message pointing them to God? Is our message pointing them to a risen Savior? Is our message one that gives hopelessness? What are we saying to the world? Through our conversation, through our Facebook post, through our text, through our conversations, what are we saying to the world? I would never want to do anything that would hinder God's 
work, the gospel, his church. And I pray that the words of my mouth would align with Psalms chapter 19, verse number 14, when the psalmist said, Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my strength and my Redeemer. We have our one-day outreach on Tuesday nights, and I pray that you are faithfully coming as you can and being a part of that and being active in sharing the gospel with our community, with our town, with our county. We want them to know Jesus Christ. But beyond that, uh, are you living it through your life and through your conversation? Are others seeing Jesus Christ through your life? Do others examine our life, our words, our actions, our deeds and say, listen, I want what they've got. I can hear and see and and experience the love of God through them. Or do they look and go, I I don't need any more of that in my life. I've, I've got enough drama already. They came and said, listen, we're rejoicing. Others were preaching the story that Mary and Mary were telling the story that Jesus has risen. They were excited with fear, the Bible says, and great joy. They were excited to tell others that we have something to rejoice about, that Jesus Christ has risen. Are you still excited that Jesus has risen from the dead? Are you still glorious about the salvation that he has wrought in your life? Or have we allowed things to rob us of our joy? There's nothing that should be able to take away the joy of our salvation, for Christ is worthy. No, they're active in their service, but also they we find here that the Bible says that they preach the gospel by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. They were spirit empowered. And I want you to know this morning that as a church, as a Christian, as a body of believers, that we need the power of the Holy Spirit of God upon our lives. We need it upon the pulpit and the preaching. We need the power of God's Spirit in our Sunday school classes, upon our music, upon our outreach, in the nursery, in the preschool department, wherever we might be in schools, at work. We need the power of God's Spirit upon our lives. And too often I'm afraid that as Christians, as a church, as believers, we have become comfortable with doing the works of the ministry of the church and we have become comfortable doing it by our own power and our own strength and our own might but if we are to make a difference we must preach the gospel through the power of the Holy Spirit of God we need him in our lives we need him in this church We must have it. We must learn to lean not upon our own understanding, but in all our ways to acknowledge him. The Bible says, and he will direct our paths. We must not lean upon our own understanding, our own knowledge, our own expertise, and instead yield wholly and solely to God. But thirdly, we see here, at the very end of verse number 12, after they had preached by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, Peter closes out this saying, things which angels desired to look into. We find here that the angels aspired to understand this great salvation. The angels wanted to understand it. I know that often we allow, as a culture, I'm afraid many Christians and believers have allowed touch by an angel to, uh, to dictate our doctrine and understanding of angels. Don't get your theology from a TV show. It's bad advice. The Bible says that the angels desire to look into. The angels couldn't understand Oh, they wanted to understand salvation. They wanted to understand the grace of God. They wanted to understand why 
God himself would come down and suffer the cross for you and I. The angels could not understand it. They wanted to understand. They desired to look into it to make sense of it. But it just did not make sense to them. They aspired, but that was it. Often people will say, that individual's an angel, and I understand that culturally we mean that is, and they're a good person, they're a sweet, kind person. But if you've known them your whole life, you've watched them grow up and born, they're not an angel. You say, preacher, you being mean? No, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I don't want to be an angel because the Bible says the angels desire to look into, to understand salvation. I'd have to take a step back to be an angel. I'm not an angel. I'm a child of God. I'm not just some created being. I'm a being that God created and loved and loved so much that he gave himself for, that he gave his life for, that to redeem us back to himself. I wouldn't trade my life to be an angel for nothing. I wouldn't wish my girls to be angels. Now, I may call them my little angels, uh, meaning they're sweet and kind, but not real angels. Why? Because they are beings that God created and loved and gave himself for. What more could we ask for? The angels, they could not understand. They did not understand the love of God. They could not understand how God could love us that much. The love of God. We sing of the love of God and how wonderful it is. How it's greater far than anything this world has to offer. And it is, but the angels, they don't understand that. Hebrews chapter 2, verse number 16 says, For he indeed does not give aid to angels, but he does give aid to the seed of Abraham. They were angels. They don't understand the love of God. Not like you or I. But the second of all, the Bible says angels inspired the love of God. But second of all, they did not understand the redemption of man. The word here that's used for aspired or to uh, desire to look into, that look into, is the same word that is used in James chapter 1, verse number 25, when the Bible says, but he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it is not of forgetful here, but a doer of the work. This one will be blessed in what he does. It's also used in Luke chapter 24 and verse number 12 when the Bible says, but Peter arose and ran to the tomb and stooping down, he saw the linen cloths lying by themselves and he departed marveling to himself at what had happened. When the Bible says the angels desire to look into, it literally gives the thought that they stoop down as Peter did at the garden and they look intently into trying to find out or discover or understand. The Bible says they desire to look into just like Peter ran to the tomb and looked in to see if Jesus was truly risen. Peter said, I have to know, is Jesus Christ risen from the dead? Does he live again? And the angels have that same passionate desire to look into it that they would run and see how is it that God could redeem man that Jesus Christ could leave the throne of heaven and come down and take on flesh of mortal man and live and die and give his life a ransom for many the angel said we don't understand it we want to know how can this love be they look but they cannot understand but they desire to that's how glorious our salvation is. It's glory enough that the prophets of old prophesied of it. The, the apostles and those who would suffer and live their lives and give their lives up a martyr's death that you and I might have the gospel of Jesus Christ that even the angels themselves desire earnestly to look into. That's how glorious our salvation is. That Jesus Christ would give himself for you and I. 
is a mystery I'll never understand. It's beyond my comprehension. I don't know how God could love me that much. I don't know. I'm sure not worthy of it. I don't deserve it. But it's a glorious salvation. And here, Peter, writing to some people who are suffering great loss. He says, I want you to remember your glorious, wonderful salvation. This morning, if you're here and you do not know Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're not sure if you die today that you would go to heaven, I want you to know that there is nothing greater you could ever know in your life or experience than the love of God, the grace of God. It's a grace that is far greater than we deserve. But Christ, in his love and compassion, willingly gave himself upon the cross. He laid down his life. The Roman soldiers did not kill Jesus. He said, no man takes my life, I give it. He freely gave up his life. The Bible says, gave up the ghost. He forfeited his life on Calvary freely for your sins. And if you do not know him as your personal Savior, I want you to know that if you'll place your faith in him, you can have the hope and assurance of your eternity. Christian, believer, child of God, do you know Christ in a personal relationship day in and day out? Do you walk with him? Do you fellowship with him? Has Satan robbed you of your joy or are you actively going out and proclaiming the good news that Jesus saves? Or has life got you bitter, broken, to the point where You're more consumed with life than you are the cross. If so, I encourage us. Would we stop? Would we step back and remember just how glorious our salvation is? And say, God, with your help, it's onward. What I want to tell the world that he's not here, he's risen. And he did so that we might have life and have it more abundantly. Every head bowed, every eye closed. As Aaron comes to play this morning, I wonder today, is there one here in our midst who would say, just no one looking around, this is just between you and the Lord, I wonder if someone who would say, Pastor, I'll be honest with you, if I died right now, I'm not sure I'd go to heaven. Preacher, I, I want to go to heaven, but if I died honestly, I, I'm just not sure if I died right now, I would go to heaven. Would you raise your hand? Just slip it up and back down. I see that hand. Is there another? I see that hand. Is there another? Would say, Raise your hand and say, Pastor, pray for me. I want to know, but I'm just not sure. I see that hand. This morning, if that's you, I want you to know today that Christ has done everything. He's paid the price. He's already laid down his life. He's done everything that needs to be done. And all that's left is for you. To simply let go and say, God, I'm not going to try to earn this. I'm not going to try to fake it. But God, I'm going to just real admit to you that I'm a sinner. God, that I deserve hell. 
God, I believe that you died for my sins, that you are the Savior, the Messiah. And God, I place my faith in you. Lord, would you take my life? Place your faith in Jesus Christ. Not just believe that he is, but put your faith in him and him alone. The Bible says if you'll do that, you can have assurance that you're a child of God. If that's you, would you pray now? Would you give your life to Christ? Would you place your faith in him? If you want somebody to pray with you, if you'll come, I'll pray with you. If not, give me after church. If you've given your life to Christ, I want to know. I want to rejoice with you. Please let me know. Maybe you're here today and you say, Pastor, I am a child of God. I'm saved. But I have allowed things in life to get me distracted from the glory of salvation. Maybe you ought to just talk to God and say, God, Satan has robbed me of my joy. He's robbed me of what really matters. I've got my eyes off of what's important. Maybe you ought to pray this morning and say, God, would you please help me to have my heart and my mind and my soul right with you. God, restore the joy of my salvation. If you need to pray, the altars are open this morning.